He grew up on a South Dakota farm that had neither electricity nor running water. Like hundreds of pilots in his generation, he saw Charles Lindbergh on a barnstorming tour and decided that he would be a pilot. He was already in flight training when World War II broke out, but was told by his superiors that at 27, he was too old to be a fighter pilot. He didn't believe them, and he talked his way into training. He was ordered to Guadalcanal, where in his first combat engagement, he shot down one Japanese aircraft and crash-landed his own. The ground crew counted more than 200 bullet holes in his plane. In a little more than two months, he shot down 26 enemy aircraft, tying the World War I record of Eddie Rickenbacker and earning the Medal of Honor. He didn't stop there. He went on to serve as governor of South Dakota, as the founding commissioner of the American Football League, and one of the key players in the creation of the Super Bowl. He is Joe Foss, and he is a legend of air power. Joe Foss was born in 1915 on a 160-acre farm east of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. His mother was Scotch-Irish and fiercely independent. His father, a charismatic Norwegian who instilled in him a spirit of adventure and an understanding of the importance of honor and service. He remembers his youth with nostalgia, a time of hunting and fishing with his younger brother and sister, and listening to his father tell remarkable stories about the times he had flown in an airplane. Airplanes were rarely seen on the South Dakota prairie back then, and the young Foss was so delighted by the idea of flying that his father took him to an air show in Sioux Falls. So we went out there, and Dad and I got on there and, and went for the ride over the city of Sioux Falls, and from that moment on, I wanted to fly myself. See? be the pilot. In those days of barnstorming pilots, Foss crossed paths with aviation a number of times, and each encounter made a deep impression on him. In 1927, he saw Charles Lindbergh as the pilot crisscrossed the country after his historic New York to Paris flight. His father took him to see marine pilots execute aerial stunts, the likes of which South Dakota had never seen before. Foss made plans to go to college and learn to fly, and his parents encouraged him to dream big dreams. And of course, everything was going good until 1933, uh, when my dad was killed uh, on the way back uh, from the field at night in a farm accident. The wires blew down and he was electrocuted, and I found him in the road. Joe was forced to temporarily abandon his dreams he enrolled in college, but dropped out when it became clear that he could not attend class and tend the farm at the same time. So instead of flying, Joe worked the fields. Then the, the airmail plane flew right over our house. Uh, so all the days that I farmed, well, I'd look up there and the pilots would fly so low that he'd wave, you know, and I'd wave at him and he was just still climbing getting out of there, and I thought, someday I'm gonna transfer from this horse rig I got here up to that airplane. At the end of 1936, he paid off the farm's $5,000 mortgage and turned the farm over to his brother. So I said to my brother, you can have this place lock, stock, and barrel, and we shook hands on it. Here's a paid off mortgage if you just support mom and sis and yourself. And he did a very good job. He returned to the University of South Dakota, working his way to a business degree by waiting tables in a restaurant. When he got a little extra money, he spent it on flying lessons at the nearby airport. When he got his pilot's license, he paid for his flight time by taking people up for rides. In 1939, he joined the Civil Pilot Training Program. And when he graduated in 1940, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and endured what is called elimination training. 
16 aspiring pilots entered the program. Only eight would move on to flight school. He came in uh, to the military with 100 hours of flying time, roughly, that he had gotten before he got in. So he had a little bit of an edge there. Foss made the cut despite the fact that he was significantly older than the other cadets. Assigned to flight school in Florida, he hitchhiked south for basic flight training in Pensacola and fighter training in Miami. I never told anybody in the Marine Corps I'd ever seen an airplane before because it makes it a little tough if you tell them, uh, you know, that I've flown, you know, and they just figured, well, this is a wise guy, so we'll show him what it's all about. But uh, when they said, that's a rudder, oh, yes, sir. And uh, I uh, played the dumb side it, as the advice of some of my predecessors. The planes they were flying were badly outdated, ancient F-2 and F-3 biplanes. While across the oceans, the Germans and Japanese were upgrading their air forces with fast, nimble monoplane fighters and bombers. That mattered little to Foss. He was racking up literally hundreds of hours of flight time and enjoying every second in the air. He got sent back to Pensacola as a flight instructor, and that's where he was when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. He talked himself into a photo reconnaissance squadron but was shocked to discover the planes they used had no guns. I was the most junior pilot in the outfit. Forty pilots were there, uh, and each of us had a desk. And my job was to take the mail from the squadron down to wing headquarters and bring back the mail from wing and group that was up there for us. On the other side of the field, Navy pilots were learning how to take off and land on aircraft carriers. Foss, a Marine pilot, asked to be transferred to the Naval unit. The Marines told him that if he could convince the Navy to accept him, they'd sign the transfer. And I finally got to see the commander, I've forgotten his name, and a Navy captain, and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, sir, I'd like to go through the school. He said, you're a Marine. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you don't go through here. We don't have any Marines over here. We don't have time to train our own people, let alone having a Marine over here. And he, I said, but I want to fly fighters and go to war. He said, I told you there's no chance. Get out of here. Foss didn't, of course, but instead hung around until the Navy agreed to let him train as a carrier pilot. He flew whenever he got a chance and earned the highest gunnery score the flight school had ever recorded. When he completed training, the Marines promoted him to captain and told him to get ready to go overseas. Yeah, I said, that's the only reason I got in the Marine Corps was to be a fighter and I'm ready to go. The Marines shipped him to a base that had pilots but no planes. He was so desperate for flight time that he went up in a Brewster Buffalo a barely flight-worthy plane that confounded even experienced pilots. Flying high over the base, he turned too tight, and the plane flipped end over end, almost killing him. Boss didn't seem to care. In September 1942, he got his orders. They didn't specify where he was going. That was a secret. But he knew he was headed for the war. Captain Joe Foss, newly installed as the executive officer of VMF-121, flew to the Pacific aboard an air transport. His unit's aircraft traveled by ship. They met up aboard the escort carrier Kapahi, and out to sea they went. They didn't tell us where we were going, <coughs> other than we were headed out there somewhere. And when we got, uh, got see, all our boxes uh, had a code on. It was a half an orange uh, with a D on it. And, it was the, and that stood for where we were going to unload, which was uh, Guadalcanal. And when I did hear it was going to Guadalcanal, I thought, I never heard of that canal when I studied geography. And of course, it's not a canal, it's an island. An island that in September 1942 was a pretty terrible place to be. The Japanese were attempting to take the island as part of their push south toward Australia. The Americans, on the other hand, had decided to make their first stand of the war there. MacArthur had been driven out of the Philippines and New Guinea was on the verge of collapse. Island after small island was coming under Japanese control. 
and the possibility that Australia might come under attack loomed large. The United States decided to stop the Japanese at Guadalcanal, an island northeast of Australia. The Japanese wanted the island for its airport. Planes based there would be able to attack the convoys that had become Australia's lifeline. The Japanese wanted the island, we wanted the island, and there was an all-out battle for it. And that's where Joe Foss really uh, won his spurs as a military aviator. On August 7th, American Marines went ashore at Guadalcanal, almost unopposed. They took the island's airstrip, which they renamed Henderson Field, and dug in. The Japanese began a relentless series of attacks. Every night, it seemed, they would appear out of the jungle, wave after wave of attackers who seemed to care little for their own lives. By day, the Japanese Air Force bombed relentlessly, sometimes hundreds of bombers at a time pummeling the Marine positions. As the ship approached Guadalcanal, Joe Foss lined up for his first combat carrier takeoff, flying his F-4F Wildcat from the Copahee to Henderson Field. They got us up in the middle of the night and said, we've got a catapult you off. Uh, because there are a bunch of Jap subs in the area and we don't want to lose you and the airplanes and the carrier uh, here now, so get goodbye. One of the 12 planes in his flight crashed into the sea. The others continued. Flying in, Foss was shocked by how battle-scarred the island was. And he come on around, made our hot shot approach and come around and landed. And of course, uh, as we taxied up, there was a big cheer from the people that were there. They, because they were leaving as soon as we got squared around, they were just happy to get out of the mangy place. Foss asked if the veterans would stick around a little while to help train his rookies. The veterans laughed, saying that after a few days, they'd all be vets anyway. That was no overstatement. The relentless Japanese attacks left little time for getting acclimated. Foss scored his first enemy kill a week after he arrived, when 32 enemy fighters and bombers appeared over Henderson Field. Foss focused on a group of four zeros. And at that time, the Lord helped us to get above these uh, airplanes. And so I figured, well, this is easy. This is duck soup. I'll pick off the number one guy. There were four airplanes down there. And I shot that number one guy down. The other three zeros took off after him. Foss was suddenly in a high-speed fight for his life. Circling above Henderson Field, being shot at by the Japanese and flying through layers of anti-aircraft flak being shot from below, Foss heard his plane being hit over and over. We got near the field, everybody shooting, and I didn't know whether they'd get me or the enemy. And they never touched a hair, either me or them. And when I hit, I was going too fast to get stopped. Foss ran off the end of the runway and into a grove of palm trees. The ground crew counted more than 250 holes in his airplane. And on the walk back up to the operations shack, he was trying to figure out a way to get out of Guadalcanal. Oh, they were hitting me on the back, congratulating me. And I looked at these kids, 17, 18, and the look I saw on them and that they were depending me, I've never gotten over. I just figured I got a lead. These kids are gonna depend on me and I've got the experience and I can, <clears throat> excuse me, I can lead these kids and we're gonna go. If they wanna go that bad. The next day, the Japanese sent in more bombers. Foss sawed the wing off another zero. Three days after that, he shot down three Japanese planes in a single day. In nine days on Guadalcanal, he had become an ace. His squadron, nicknamed Foss's Flying Circus, was also running up a spectacular record. The Japanese set October 25th as the day they would conquer Guadalcanal, and in the weeks before the invasion, they ratcheted up the pressure on the Americans fighting there. The enemy fleet pulled in and parked out there and started firing at us broadside at uh, 9.30 in the evening. And it went with no stop, no time out, till 4.30 a.m. And we were in right in the middle of the impact area. It was 14-inch guns. And the uh, enemy planes were flying over, dropping bombs and dropping those uh, star uh, lights that they dropped so you can... It's like an acetylene torch, 
It just daylight, and there we were pinned down. The bombardment killed men, destroyed aircraft, and pocked Henderson's Field dirt runway. The Japanese came in the next day, expecting to be able to land on the field. Voss had only eight aircraft that were flightworthy, and two of those crashed on takeoff. The remaining six Marine Wildcats lifted off to take on a sky full of Japanese planes. On October 25, 1942, the Japanese planned to take Henderson Field and Guadalcanal. With only eight flight-worthy aircraft, Joe Foss and his Flying Circus took off to take on a much larger Japanese force. In the days when Joe Foss was flying airplanes, uh, you got close. And one of the first lessons he learned was not to use your ammunition up at an enemy that's far away. You waited until you got close. You only had so many rounds in the, in the airplane. You had to preserve them. This is in your face, uh, Joe Foss against whoever he was against flying, and, and he was a master at it. Foss claimed two of the Marine kills that morning, but came down angry at himself for wasting ammunition and missing other opportunities. In the afternoon, he went back up and knocked down three more enemy aircraft. Five planes in one day made him the first Marine ace in a day. 14 victories overall in only 14 days made him one of the high profile heroes of the early part of the war. I've read that so many times today where it was like a race to see who'd get the most airplane. I didn't give a hoot who got the airplane. What, what I was interested is getting that sucker today so he wouldn't be back tomorrow. It seemed as if Foss's war was moving in fast motion. In early November, after attacking a Japanese destroyer, he crash-landed into the ocean. He floated in shark-infested waters, was rescued by natives, and hidden by nuns before being rescued by a Catalina flying boat. He received the Distinguished Flying Cross from Admiral Bull Halsey, and then, three days later, helped turn away a flight of Japanese bombers and fighters attacking a convoy of reinforcements for Guadalcanal. And they encountered a, a substantially larger group, estimated at about 60 Japanese airplanes, uh, intent upon dropping their bombs on American targets. And rather than engage the, uh, the enemy, he uh, basically held high, making the Japanese think that he was a decoy to try to get them to attack him. And the Japanese, fearing that there was a larger group waiting for them to do just that, in fact, dropped their bombs and uh, headed back to where they came from. Voss had an incredible 23 kills when he contracted malaria. He spent six weeks out of action, then returned to Guadalcanal on New Year's Day. He started flying again two weeks later and immediately shot down three more enemy planes. That brought his total to 26, a tie with the legendary World War I ace Eddie Rickenbacker. The fighting at Guadalcanal died down in February 1943. The Japanese, frustrated by the tenacity of the American defenders, gave up their hopes of taking the island. The sea lanes to Australia were safe, at least from the air, and the tide of the war in the Pacific had changed. The Marines rotated Foss back to the United States. President Roosevelt pinned the Congressional Medal of Honor on his chest. And he went out on what he called a dancing bear act to sell war bonds. Assigned to set up and train a new squadron, Foss found himself dealing with a new aircraft, the F-4U Corsair. The Corsairs had problems. The engine stalled, and his training pilots ended up having to bail out. And then there were a lot of other problems with the airplane. It just was a new airplane off the line, and it wasn't quite tuned in yet. So I was having a heck of a time with him there. Foss asked his commanding officer for help. I've got all these green mechanics here that don't know a haystack from a pitchful, and uh, they're just green, and uh, I don't have enough uh, talent really to handle things here. I need an expert. Foss was stunned when the expert turned out to be Charles Lindbergh. We visited a little bit and about the time I saw him, and so forth at Sioux Falls back in 1927. And then he says, well, I'm the expert and I'm here to get things done. I want to go and get a place to stay and, uh, and then I'm all set to go to work. 
I said, you don't have to get a place to stay. You can stay at my house. I got plenty of room. So Charles Lindbergh moved in while he worked on the problem with the Corsairs. And when he was finished, Foss said that Lindbergh could fly with his squadron anytime he wanted. The new squadron, VMF-115, moved to the South Pacific a few months later. And sure enough, Lindbergh showed up and for three weeks flew dive bombing missions with Foss and his men. When the war ended, Foss remained one of the outstanding American fighter races. Others had eclipsed his kill total, but a look at Foss's career needs to include the accomplishments of the units he led. On Guadalcanal, Foss's flying circus shot down more than 60 Japanese aircraft. Foss got 26 of those. The small group of flyers working in nearly impossible conditions had played a critical role in a critical American victory. I think Joe Foss is, is the kind of guy everybody wants to be. Uh, you know, all-American boy. I think he's the person that doesn't settle for anything in his own personal life other than perfection or as close as he can get to it. And I think that just pretty much permeates his entire life, whether it was his childhood, whether it was his military career, whether it was uh, his life after he got out of the military. He doesn't settle for second best. Back home in South Dakota, Foss helped set up the South Dakota Air National Guard and served two terms as his home state's governor. He was president of the National Rifle Association, developed and hosted the television program, The American Sportsman, and served as commissioner of the startup American Football League, which eventually merged into the NFL. Fighter pilot Tex Hill, a longtime friend of Foss's, liked to kid his fellow fighter ace about his long and varied life. I always kid him. I said, Joe, I said, I don't know what, what's going to happen to you. I said, the de you been shot down four times. I said, they, and you're still around. I said, I know what the problem is. The devil won't have you. The Lord won't take you. I said, you're going to have to live in this purgatory forever. I think when you look at the number of airplanes that he shot down within that uh, period between 42 and 43 in that short period of time, five in one day, a uh, Medal of Honor, uh, and, and his success just as a military pilot, uh, that, that says loads as far as his ambition and his ability to set his mind on a goal and do well at it. In 2003, Joe Foss died in Arizona, his adopted home state. He died as he lived, respected, secure in his belief in God, his country, and himself.